One of the most iconic heroines in cinema is Ellen Ripley, and one of the more prevalent cycles in both film and literature is the hero's journey as described by Joseph Campbell in his 1949 book The Hero with a Thousand Faces. He drew on commonalities in theme and story from ancient myths and developed a cycle that many of the heroes in those stories pass through to achieve their quest. There's never been any indication that any of the Alien films were written to follow the hero's journey template in the way that Star Wars, The Matrix or even the Lego movie were. However, the purpose of this series is to examine both the films and the cycle to see where they intersect and where they don't. For those who aren't familiar, there are three stages, departure, initiation and return, divided up into a number of sub-stages, 17 in total. This series assumes that the audience is familiar with the theatrical versions of Alien, Alien 3 and Alien Resurrection, and the special edition of Aliens. Of course, this is one person's interpretation that might read too much into some things and draw some long bows for the sake of exploring an idea. Each cycle commences in the ordinary world, and there is little more ordinary than the Freighter Nostromo, at least to her bored and underpaid crew. Dallas, Kane, Ripley, Lambert, Ash, Parker and Brett. The journey's first step is the call to adventure. In this case, the transmission they've been woken up to investigate. The second step is the refusal of the call. Ripley doesn't actually emerge as the hero as such until just over 70 minutes into the film, and it's much more of an ensemble piece with the main dynamic being between Dallas, Ripley and Ash. So the refusal of the call isn't Ripley here, but Parker and Brett. Lambert exhibits some cautiousness, but the engineers flat out refuse to go in. It's not until Ash starts quoting contractual obligations that the crew are forced into the adventure. And it could be interpreted as Ash being the next step, supernatural aid. It isn't revealed for another hour or so, but Ash, as an android, could quite easily be defined as supernatural not in the sense of being magical, as the term is often used, but literally beyond nature. However, he is not an aid to the characters, but does act as a guide to the story. First by quoting regulations that will deprive Parker and Brett of their shares, then later letting the infected Kane back on board in defiance of orders and quarantine laws, then finally trying to murder Ripley when she discovers his secret order to bring the alien back to Earth. Ash's aid is in service of the creature. Often in the hero's journey, the supernatural aid will come in the form of knowledge or other gifts that will help the hero on their way, and Ripley's suspicion of Ash is what aided her to seek further knowledge that ultimately revealed his agenda. Step four is crossing the first threshold, which is broadly the section of the movie where the Nostromo lands and plans are made to trace the mysterious transmission to its source. This is where the hero, or heroes in this instance, leave the ordinary world and venture into the unknown. Arriving at the derelict spacecraft, Kane descends into the next step, almost literally from a visual standpoint, the belly of the whale. Campbell talks about the hero being a willing participant in his own metamorphosis, which is true of Kane, the most eager of the astronauts to explore the strange ship. Campbell goes on, the hero, instead of conquering or conciliating the power of the threshold, is swallowed into the unknown and would appear to have died. Cain is literally swallowed by the ship, descends into the belly where he encounters the facehugger and metamorphosis begins. As Ash later states, the alien that ultimately bursts from Cain is his son, and according to the law developed by the creators of the film, the host helps determine the look of the final creature. Cain may not have metamorphosized himself, but part of him lives on in the alien. Campbell also talks about how the hero passing beyond the confines of the visible world, going down into the bowels of the ship, quote, corresponds to the passing of a worshipper into a temple, unquote. These temples are often flanked by gargoyles. This one was guarded by the dead space jockey, the hole in his chest a stark warning. Following is the road of trials, where the hero must pass a series of tests to further their transformation. Although we have observed a kind of transformation commencing with Cain being impregnated by the alien, Cain himself has nothing to overcome in this transformation 
as he is comatose for the next 20 minutes of the film's running time and only wakens to die. Instead, there is a different transformation going on in the form of Ripley. She does nothing to refuse the call to adventure as she very much does things by the rules. However, this resolve is constantly chipped away by others. Her authority is challenged by Parker. Ash questions her judgment when she deciphers the transmission as a warning and says she's going out after her shipmates to tell them. Ash openly defies her to open the airlock, and then again when he undermines her by appealing straight to Dallas to keep the dead face hugger. Dallas then questions her judgment again when he elects to take off from the planet, despite Ripley telling him that the repairs haven't been completed. She is someone desperately trying to maintain some sort of order in the face of fellow crew members who don't care about such things and an alien life form on board that bled acid through two decks. It could be argued either way if Ripley actually passes these trials, because in each of the aforementioned examples she loses the argument, or on the other hand she remains steadfast in doing things by the book in spite of losing. At this point in the cycle we start to see real departures from the hero's journey. The journey often revolves around a quest to attain something. Once there is a monster running around the ship, the quest is simply not to get killed by it. Plans are formulated to deal with it but fail. The step of meeting with the goddess doesn't really apply as it involves the hero experiencing an all-encompassing love. The crew of the Nostromo barely tolerate each other at the best of times. There is certainly a sense of loss when Kane, Brett and Dallas are killed, but it doesn't approach what anyone would call love. The two closest characters in that regard would be Parker and Brett, but their friendship can't be properly applied to this step. Mother, the ship's computer, who might fit the bill as the goddess, is distant and generally silent, and certainly not capable of loving her children. The next step, woman as temptress, is more generally a temptation presented to the hero to try and get them to stray away from their quest. Again, with the quest not being clearly defined beyond survival, this can be difficult to apply. One idea could be Lambert trying to get Ripley to abandon ship when the latter elects to continue with Dallas's failed plan. Again, we see Ripley's authority challenged, though she has reached a point in her own transformation when she is open to that authority being questioned, asking Lambert if she has a better idea. However, Ripley decides to stay the course, even perhaps avoiding responsibility by trusting in her dead captain's judgment as much as she would a rule book. However, by this point, she has ultimate authority on the ship, which brings us to the step atonement with the father, or the confrontation with that which holds power. She quickly realises that the very company whose rules she trusted holds the power in the form of Ash and his special orders to secure an alien specimen, to the deaths of the crew if need be. She seeks to understand more of what is going on by reconnecting Ash, but learns nothing more and during this step Ripley effectively transforms. The rules, devised by an entity that doesn't care if she lives or dies, don't apply anymore. Lambert's plan to abandon ship is chosen, despite the fact it likely condemns one of the surviving three to a slow death rather than a quick one at the hands of the alien. Another example of atonement with the father is a false one. When Dallas, for all intents and purposes the hero of the story until his death, seeks enlightenment from Mother. However, Dallas soon realises that Mother doesn't actually hold any real power or wisdom that can be imparted, and thus dies while confronting the alien. The step of apotheosis, where there is a period of rest and fulfilment before returning to the ordinary world, could be applied here in that they now have a more clearly defined quest of escaping the ship with enough supplies, where the shuttle Narcissus, once detached from the Nostromo, represents the ordinary world. The following step of the ultimate boon is generally when the hero achieves their goal. Though the quest such as it is is still ongoing, Ripley has found out about the truth now, that the company wanted the creature and effectively set this whole series of events in motion before they left Thetis for home. The step of refusal of the return doesn't really work here, as no doubt the crew would love nothing more to return to the ordinary world with the truth about their employer as well as their lives. However, it could be interpreted as Ripley not wanting to return to her former ways. Additionally, Parker and Lambert don't refuse to return, but are in fact denied the opportunity when the alien corners and kills them. 
The magic flight is one of the simpler, more literal steps as it can be seen with Ripley launching the shuttle to escape the extraordinary world that the alien brought with it from the planet to the Nostromo and back to the ordinary world. She's still surrounded by technology, but it's small and intimate rather than the vast chambers and endless dark corridors. And Jones the Cat presents a link to the ordinary world before they landed on the planet. Jones' link with the ordinary world could also be seen as part of the rescue from without step of the journey. Even though Ripley believes she has won at this point and doesn't need rescue from the immediate but unknown threat of the alien on the shuttle, the simple act of cuddling the cat can be used to calm the trauma of her experience. When the alien reveals itself, the next two steps in the journey, crossing the return threshold and the master of two worlds, may be combined. In order to win, Ripley must again discard the rules. There are no rules to deal with this sort of situation. There were rules, but others ignored them. Ash opened the airlock to let the alien on board. Now Ripley must open it to get it out. However, just because she uses her own wits in this situation rather than abdicating responsibility to someone else's instructions, doesn't mean she ignores the quest of surviving. She dons the spacesuit, the sensible sort of thing the old Ripley would do, then opens the hatch to explosively decompress the shuttle, something the old Ripley would not. The alien, still tethered umbilically by the belly with a harpoon, almost seems to be wanting to return to the shuttle as if it were a womb, assuming a fetal position inside one of the engines, before Ripley burns it to death. The final step in the journey, the freedom to live, comes as Ripley fully returns to the ordinary world, again cradling the cat, as she records her final report. Despite all that has happened, she speaks confidently that all will be well and she'll be picked up after reaching the frontier. However, the Ripley we met at the start is now gone. Just as her shipmates have transformed by being vaporised, she has transformed into something different, as we shall see next time.